Romeo. Hello everybody, you're welcome back again to the Reggae Appreciation Society. The subject of today's video is an artist whose musical focus took one of the most dramatic turns in the history of reggae music. Since the genre's inception in the 1960s, it's almost been the norm for new artists to start off writing and performing non-conscious material and over time morphing into messengers of spiritual, political and social significance, with the likes of Buju Branton and Dennis Brown being prime examples. But the original poster boy of this phenomenon is the mesmerizing Max Romeo. In 1968, he burst onto the world stage with a massively successful single that sparked international outrage due to his sexually charged lyrics. Though fairly tame by today's standards, it was deemed raunchy enough to be banned by the BBC and the airwaves. But less than a decade after his controversial smash hit, he had released a slew of heavy conscious reggae albums, including the definitive War in a Babylon, an album that is surely among the greatest roots albums of all time, and one third of what is popularly referred to as the holy trinity of legendary producer Lee Scratch Perry's finest productions. Blessed with one of the most emotive and sincere voices in the genre, he emerged as one of the foremost Rastafari ambassadors of the golden age of reggae and the yardstick by which roots reggae artists are measured by until today. The story of Max Romeo began as Maxwell Smith on the 22nd of November 1947 in a town called St. Deca in St. Anne's Parish of Jamaica. Seeking a way out of his bleak circumstances, he left home at the age of 14 and took up menial jobs including cleaning irrigation ditches at sugar plantations. But alongside his day job, he was also an aspiring singer. He won a talent contest at the age of 18 and that victory gave him a boost of self-confidence in his talent and inspired him to move to Kingston with the hopes of becoming a star one day. He met two other young men who were also seeking a breakthrough in the music industry. Max and those two lads named Kenneth Knight and Lloyd Shakespeare, who was the elder brother of legendary bassist Robbie Shakespeare, came together to form a group which they called The Emotions, with Max on lead vocals. After a year of grinding, they recorded their first single in 1966 called Buy You a Rainbow. This song blew up into an immediate hit that set the island's airwaves ablaze. In just one year, the trio had found success and they proved that their debut was no fluke as they amassed a string of highly successful singles over the next two years. Max also co-founded a group called the Hippie Boys and recruited eventual Bob Marley and the Whalers Rhythm section as Tom Barrett and Carlton Barrett. By 1968, Max Smith had taken the stage name Max Romeo and embarked on a solo career. He was then working with famous producer Bonnie Lee as a resident vocalist and songwriter, contributing to the projects of the likes of then popular artists like Derek Morgan and Slim Smith, who recorded their material with Bonnie Lee. At the time, he had failed to make any impact on the charts like he had done as a lead singer of The Emotions. Bonnie Lee, along with the likes of King Tubby, was a pioneer of dub and also one of the first to start the trend of using the same instrumentals or rhythms for different artists. It was the job of Max Romeo to write songs for such rhythms and paved the way for him to score what would become his biggest hit. He wrote a song called Wet Dream that suited the instrumentals of a Derek Morgan track called Hold You Jack. After submitting the song to Bonnie Lee, the producer offered it to Derek Morgan who turned it down due to the naughty lyrics. He also offered it to Slim Smith and all the famous artists who recorded with him, but they all recoiled over the lyrics, which they felt were too controversial and naughty. But Bonnie Lee really liked the song and was determined to get it recorded. He suggested that Max Romeo sing it himself. And funnily, Max, who had penned the lyrics, also tried to avoid singing it until Lee threatened to fire him unless he did it. Bonnie Lee didn't have a studio of his own and took Max to record at Coxon Dodd's Studio One. When Dodd heard the lyrics of the song, he tried to stop them recording it in his studio, saying the music was too dirty, but got pushed back from Lee and after all the struggles, Wet Dream was finally recorded. It was worth all the trouble as it immediately became a big hit in Jamaica. It also took off in the UK and flew up to number 10 in that country's charts, where it remained for more than 6 months. But despite its popularity and chart success, it was banned by the BBC after it was played only twice. Max tried to douse the controversy by claiming that the song was only about a leaky roof, but the UK authorities weren't moved in the least. 
The song also caught on in the Netherlands, but due to the controversy it has stirred up, it was retitled The Dream and eventually peaked at number 11 in that country's charts. All in all, a smash hit that sold a quarter of a million copies. He released his debut album The Dream in 1970, which alongside Wet Dream had 10 other songs of highly similar subject matter. He went on to record several records for Bonnie Lee, as well as songs for other producers. But as the time came for Max to start recording singles for his next album, his inspiration had shifted sharply to more conscious topics which were politically and socially relevant. The shift from slackness was most likely a result of working with a young producer who had a strong Rastafarian foundation. This producer's name was Winston Holness, aka Naini the Observer a fiery roots reggae producer whose 1970 track Blood and Fire had become a big hit in Jamaica and went on to become a roots reggae classic. Incidentally, Naini would have the same effects later in the decade on Dennis Brown and Freddie McGregor when he produced Brown's first roots album in 1977's Wolf and Leopard as well as McGregor's first roots album in 1979's Mr. McGregor. Another factor that would have fueled his shift was the turbulent political situation in Jamaica in the run-up to the 1972 elections with political violence sweeping the island. By the time he released his second album, Let the Power Fall, his fan base was shocked that the light-hearted material in his dream album had been replaced with fiery political content, but his brilliance captivated both old and new fans. His next album, Revelation Time, which was released in 1975, revealed an even deeper immersion into conscious material with tracks like Blood of the Prophet, Revelation Time, Three Blind Mice, and Open the Iron Gate, a brilliant offering that featured amazing instrumentalists that included the Barrett Brothers, as well as production inputs from Lee Scratch Perry, who produced the track Three Blind Mice. Perry and Max had been friends for some years, and his contribution to Romeo's album had impressed him so much that when it was time to record his next album, it was Lee Scratch Perry that he turned to to produce it for him. Perry had not long before then opened his Black Axe studios and was deploying equal measures of brilliance and eccentricity to create amazing legendary sound. As Romeo was writing songs for his new album, his mood and subject matter was heavily affected by the terrible political violence that was tearing up his country. This climate inspired the song War in a Babylon. This routine masterpiece caught the attention of Chris Blackwell, who one day visited the Black Axe studios and heard it playing. Blackwell was blown away and immediately signed Max Romeo to Island Records. So Romeo and Perry went to work to produce the music that would eventually make up the phenomenal War in Babylon album. In the history of Roots Reggae, it's one of the most radical, fiery and mesmerizing bodies of music ever put together, with a genius producer in the Scratch Perry and devastating instrumentals from the Upsetters band. The opening track was the menacing One Step Forward which was an almost four-minute roast of then Prime Minister Michael Manley and his PNP party. Michael Manley and his party had won the elections on a wave of hope, but had shown himself to be your average politician. The most popular track from the album was the landmark Chase the Devil, a song which had been sampled heavily in the years since its release by many artists including techno dance group Polygy and US rapper Jay-Z. It's regarded by many as his best song, but strange enough, when it was completed, Max Romeo didn't want it on the album. Lee Scratch Perry insisted, and it turned out to be the most successful track on the album. Every song on the album was practically perfect and amounted to one of the greatest reggae albums we will ever hear. Despite a wonderful experience recording the album with Perry, Romeo and his producer fell out shortly after the album's release and never worked together again. Jan knows how many classics that those two would have made. It was a terrible blow to reggae music as they had unbelievable chemistry. It also affected Romeo's career negatively. His next album, titled Reconstruction, was released in 1977. It was self-produced and lacked the quality of previous albums and of course, light years away from War in a Babylon. And in 1978, Romeo moved to New York and took a three-year break from recording. He co-wrote and starred in a Broadway musical titled Reggae. It was a successful show and Romeo went on to collaborate with legendary rock band The Rolling Stones, singing backup on some of their songs, and when it was time to record his next album in 1981, it was co-produced by Rolling Stones guitarist Keith Richards. His 1981 album was titled Holding Out My Love To You and was a moderately successful release, but of course, nowhere near the quality of War In A Babylon. As the 80s unfolded, his new material sort of faded into the background 
But despite the lack of quality new songs or albums, he was still in high demand for concerts and tours all over the world and basically toured non-stop for decades. By the 90s, his form had picked up again and released a slew of albums that rekindled interest in the new generation of fans. Over the years, he's released 45 albums in a 57-year career and is set to release his 46th in April this year. His last album titled World of Ghouls was released in 2021 and still packs a punch with hard-hitting lyrics and emotive vocals. In January this year, Romeo announced that he would be embarking on his final world tour starting in May. It will be the end of an era for one of the most radical and influential reggae ambassadors that the reggae movement has ever seen. Not to mention that he has one of the longest running careers in the genre. The mesmerizing Max Romeo is a special talent and one whose impact on Roots Reggae continues to be the benchmark and a yardstick of what Roots Reggae is supposed to sound like. So there you have it. Thank you for watching the video today. Please leave a like, subscribe and until next time, jobless.